What a delight to see David again. <laughs> oh, it's such a blessing. I'm so glad he came. Now, if he could just slip in just there about once a month, that'd be wonderful. <laughs> I just want to say a word, too. I'm so thankful for the music. To think that God would pick the music for us. Isn't that something? I think that is absolutely marvelous. I've been so thrilled this morning as I've listened to the music. Uh, has a little theme of redemption running through it. And I want to preach a little about redemption this morning, and I was just thrilled to listen to the songs. But more than that, I'd like to say a word to the choir to encourage them, well, all the singers. We enjoy the music thoroughly. It's a thrill to me just to listen to it, but I want you to know there's something more than our enjoyment. Do you know that that music drives out the powers of darkness? and prepares the way for the message? Yes, Brother, I want to tell you, every one of you choir members, when you get up here and sing, you're driving out darkness. And it's worth it. It's worth it for the message alone. See, that clears the atmosphere so that you can hear. And uh, so I want to encourage you to come and sing. You're doing more than in just letting us enjoy it. You're really serving a tremendous purpose. If we could see the atmosphere clear because of the way you sing, I want to tell you, it, I believe it would encourage your hearts. Well, if you have your Bibles, <clears throat> let's turn to the book of Hebrews, the second chapter. And I want to begin reading with the uh, 14th verse, Hebrews 2:14. The writer of Hebrews says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. May the Lord add his blessing <coughs> excuse me, to the reading of his precious word. I want to give you a little picture, try to give you just a little, it'd be just a little picture of redemption. Here it says, I want to back in this, uh, what is it, 16th verse. He, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Uh, he came down past the angels. He was made a little lower than the angels to get a hold of the seed of Abraham and redeem them. Now I want you to notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that he took on him the seed of Adam. It says he took on him the seed of Abraham. He came all the way from glory not to get a hold of the human race. He didn't get a hold of everybody. He didn't come to get a hold of everybody. He came to get, he came all the way down to get a hold, to take hold of, uh, that word is to, to take hold of Adam, I mean of, of uh, Abraham's seed. And that took means to lay hold of. Uh, he got a hold of the children of Abraham. Now, I know the real seed of Abraham was Christ, but here in this context, he's getting hold of the children of Abraham. Nobody else. He came all the way down from glory, not to get a hold of the world. But the, but the children of Abraham. Well, who are the children of Abraham? In, we can turn to Galatians for that answer. And I want to turn and read it from the Word of God so that uh, you'll know that I'm taking it from God's Word in the third chapter of Galatians. 
In the sixth verse, it says, Even Abraham believed God. As Abraham believed God, and it was counted him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith are the children of Abraham? I want you to get this. Jesus came down to get a hold of the children of faith. That's all. Nobody else. He took hold of those who would submit to Christ, believe in Christ, believe him, and those, it says, who believe are the children of Abraham. Those who believe. So Jesus came all the way from glory to get a hold of those who would believe. Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness, and I want you to know, for those that believe, I want you to know that faith gets God's attention. I want to read in St. John's Gospel, the 8th chapter and the 59th verse. <clears throat> Here Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and, uh, and they were saying, well, we're Abraham's seed. He said, you're of your father the devil. And they got so uh, exasperated with him. They wanted to pick up stones. They wanted to stone. They wanted to kill him. And so in the 59th verse of the 7th, Eighth chapter, the 59th verse, it says, They took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple and through the midst of them so passed by. They were going to pick up stones and, and stone him, but it says he hid himself. He was right in, walked right in the middle of them, and they, he hid himself in the middle. They couldn't see him. Now, I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of Mark the seventh chapter, <clears throat> and I want you to see something here, starting with the 24th verse. Mark 7, 24. It says, And from thence he arose and went to the borders of Tyre and Sidon, and entered into a house, and would have no man know it, but he could not hide himself. He just got done hiding himself from a whole multitude of people, and now it says here he couldn't hide himself. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. He, he, was, he didn't want, he says here deliberately, he didn't want anybody to know it. He was going to hide himself, but he couldn't hide himself from this woman. I want you to know that he could not hide himself from faith. This Gentile, Greek, Syrophoenician woman found Jesus. Faith finds him, and I marvel at this woman. I really do. Brother Oliver preaches a beautiful sermon on her on Mother's Day. The old woman, great is thy faith. Jesus can't hide from faith. As I said, I marvel at this woman. She was a Gentile. She had no claim on Jesus whatsoever. She didn't have any promise to stand on. She was a Gentile. And I don't like it further. She didn't offer him anything either. She didn't offer him money or say, Lord, if you'll do this, I'll do this. She didn't offer him a thing. She came because of who he was and not what she was or what she could do. Makes me awful happy. <laughs> Brother, she came because of who he was. I love that. She didn't say, now Lord, if you'll heal my daughter, I'll do this. She didn't ask anything of the kind. She came because of who he was. And she stood on that ground and that ground alone, the ground of faith. No wonder that Jesus couldn't hide from that. Said he wanted to be hid, he didn't want to be seen, but he couldn't hide from faith. And he still can't hide from faith. So this dear woman offered him no money, she offered him nothing. She simply came and asked for mercy, that's all. And Jesus, no wonder, he said, woman, oh woman, great is thy faith. Jesus could not hide from that kind of faith. 
Faith will get God's attention, and he can't hide himself from you. If you've got faith in your heart in God, I want you to know that Jesus came down. Uh, he came down to get a hold of those who had faith, those who would get a hold. The children of Abraham, they're the ones of faith. He came all the way from heaven to, to find you. So Jesus came down to get a hold of you and to lift you above the angels. As Paul said in the third chapter of Philippians, that he was apprehended by Jesus Christ, and then from then on he sought to, to find what he had been apprehended for. He sought for it. Jesus came to redeem those who would believe. I'm so thankful for that. In the Old Testament, to redeem, they killed thousands of animals. Thousands were slain. But they could not redeem one soul. They found forgiveness, but they were a picture of one, but they could not find because the law said before any Israelite could be redeemed, there had to be a kinsman redeemer, and an animal couldn't do it. That makes me think of the beautiful picture. That's why the beautiful picture in the book of Ruth is there. That only one who could redeem was a red kinsman was a kinsman. The only one who could redeem was a kinsman. So Jesus came down and took on himself the seed of Abraham. And one reason to go to Israel, I like to go to Israel, is to find our heritage. Do you know that's our heritage as much as the Jews? Yes. Yes. I'm not looking where the Jews, where Abraham lived. That's my, that's my heritage. I'm a child of Abraham, and whatever God did to Abraham when he slew his son on Mount Moriah, I'm finding my heritage. So, the trip to Israel, how marvelous to see where Jesus walked, and for the one who got a hold of me and raised me up in you too. I think in one of those trips to Israel, Remember, some of you were on that trip where the two boats met out in the Sea of Galilee. Some of you were there. And they had a little worship service, and Daniel Light stood and started to sing, There Comes Jesus Walking on the Water. Oh, it was a thrilling time. <laughs> Just to hear him sing it again to remind us of our heritage. So, uh, in Israel we find where our roots are. That's our, that's our real roots. I had the privilege the uh, last week of meeting my aunt that I told you about that I had discovered in Kanawha City, and we had a beautiful time together. She's a lovely lady, 89 years of age, and she really brought me up on my heritage and background and aunts and uncles, and it was a delightful time to find more about my roots even in this place. But the real roots are here. The real roots are the children of God. The real roots are in Jesus Christ. So that beautiful picture of Ruth in the book of Ruth, when she finally went to Israel to glean in the fields, I want you to know that she didn't know she was in the field of a kinsman redeemer. She didn't know it. It says by chance. That's what she thought. Do you know, dear ones, that I want you to know that some of you may think it's by chance that you got here, but not a one of you got here by chance. God's great providence has watched over you as much as he watched over Ruth and brought her when she made up her mind to go with Naomi. I want you to know from then on she was under God's divine hand of providence and he was leading her every step of the way. Once she made up her mind and said, I'll not leave thee, God's hand was on that girl and started guiding her every step of the way. And as soon as you start with Jesus, the divine hand of providence is on you and guides every step of the way. You're not living by chance anymore. So it was by chance. Ah, uh, but God got her into the field. What of a kinsman redeemer? It was God who got you in touch with a kinsman redeemer, which is Jesus Christ our Lord. Even so, God's hand has been directing you every step of the way. God's got you here. Oh, I went to God that people could understand that. What a privilege it has been that God has gotten you in this place. So, 
And the Alma said to Ruth when he came back to Israel, go and glean in the field. And then when she found out she was in the field of a kinsman redeemer, Neoma told her, said, go up night up to the threshing floor and you lay at the feet of Boaz and when he awakens, you ask him to, you ask him to put his skirt over you. That seems a strange story to some people, but not in that day. So she did that. She went up and lay at the feet of Boaz and when he awakened in the night, she said to him, put your skirt over me. You know what that was? She was saying, you're my kinsman redeemer. Will you marry me? Let's read what she was asking. Because you are a kinsman redeemer for Naomi. And uh, now Boaz said to her, the people know that you are a pure woman. There was nothing impure about this. They said, you are a pure, he said, you are a pure woman. And so we find that uh, uh, she was after a redeemer husband. I marvel at this woman. When she left to go with Naomi, she left, she said, your people will be my people, your God will be my God, and where you die, I'll die. She came for one purpose, to stick with Naomi, whatever the price, and for her God would be her God. Didn't make any difference. Whatever the cost was, she had, she had set her sights to go down a certain line, and uh, it was for the kingdom of God. I marvel at that. She was after a redeemer more than a husband. Oh, I tell you. Well, you may say, Brother Morgan, she married, he was an older man, and uh, he, he praised her for wanting a redeemer rather than choosing a young man for a husband. He praised her for that. You say to me, Brother Morgan, was she happy? Well, I want to ask you a question. It all depends on what it takes to make you happy. Now, if what it takes to make some people happy, she wouldn't have been happy. To a lot of people, uh, they wouldn't have been happy because they would have gone back with Orpah to begin with. They'd have turned back long ago. But see, Ruth was after something else. And therefore, it makes me think of Jesus. Jesus never got married at all. Was he happy? You answer me. Come on, was he happy? He said, I delight to do thy will, O God. He delighted to do the will of God. He was happy doing the will of God. You see, the difficulty is so many people have not found the place of where to be happy. What makes them happy? In America, it seems that we're living in an age when it takes things to make us happy. Our happiness depends on things. If we get them, we're happy. If we don't, we're unhappy. And in marriage, many times it's the same thing. If we can get the things we want, we're happy. If not, we're very unhappy. This man or this woman can't make me happy. <laughs> uh, you don't care if I laugh, do you? It depends on what it takes to make you happy. Those who sought the kingdom of God and really go after the kingdom of God are delighted in anything taking place in the kingdom of God. They are happy. Do you ever see a happier man than Brother Helm? He's laughing. He doesn't tell jokes to laugh, but brother, he's laughing a good bit of the time. You want a happy man? You found one. Where does his happiness come from? I think of this trip to Israel, uh, and, and to the Jew, 
I tell you, a son brings great joy. We have no idea. I don't think we understand at all the, the joy that a Jewish person finds in having a, a son or someone to carry on an inheritance, the family name, the family uh, values, and uh, so on. I don't think we have any idea what that means to a Jew. Or oh, we appreciate our children in that, but it doesn't have the family significance. I think of Paul. Uh, when we went to Israel one time and brought it, when he brought out his grandson, did you see how, those who were on that, did you see how proud he was of a grandson? We've got a son, Brother Hill, look, and to the whole group of people there, here he is, he's a guide, but he wants us to know he had a son, he's had a grandson. Thrill. I heard this Howard Cosell, this great uh, news uh, commentator, that some of you that watch the news remember that name, a very famous name. Somebody interviewed him one day and said, what's the most important thing in your life? What means the most important? He said, my family. A Jew. His family means more to him.